All right, y'all. Y'all online, y'all in here, admit it. You missed me, right? <laughs> well, guess what? Just like the Terminator, I'm back. <laughs> I have to keep coming back. Now, for you guys that are, are just new to us online, let me explain. I am the manager of a large dance academy. And uh, for the last couple weeks, we have been preparing for our Nutcracker and our holiday uh, shows and all our baby mini shows and everything. So in four days, we did four dress rehearsals and six performances. All right, now it wasn't just me. I didn't go out and do the little two step. You know, I don't dance. That's for my daughter. But I was in charge of over 450 kids and all their parents and all the volunteers backstage. So I had a huge, huge job. Well, let me tell you what, the first day was rough. And Miss Myrna's here. She was backstage with me. She can detest to this. It was rough. It was pouring down rain. It was the day when we had all the flood warnings. And, and you know, it kept coming across our phone, you know, stay at home, shelter at home, do not go outside. And me and all the volunteers are backstage going, no, we have all your children. Come get them. Don't leave us with them, please. You know? But if everybody was just in such a terrible mood, okay, not only just because of the rain, but it seemed like every single thing went wrong. People were mad. The parents were angry with me. The parents, the, the, if the volunteers were angry with us. The children were angry. They were little terrors, you know, and it's just like, this is not normal. What is going on? And my husband will tell you, all the way home from the auditorium, I cried. I was exhausted. And I'm just like, I am dreading the next three days. If today is any, any sign of what it's going to be like the rest of this week, forget it. I don't want to do it. I am turning in my resignation right now. I got home. My husband loved on me. He massaged my feet. He was so great. So I got to love the pastor. <laughs> I'll give you credit. All right. So. I decided, you know, I can't do this the next three days. And I'm like, God, what is going on? What happened? It, this has never been like this backstage before. And God told me, you left me at home. You didn't bring me with you. Now, Exodus 17, Moses refers to God as being the banner that goes before us. I left my banner at home. I went on my own strength, and I went to that auditorium, and I thought that, hey, you know, I have done this for 15 years. This is going to be a breeze. I can do it all on my own. And I left God at home. Psalms 143.8 says, let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting in you. Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. So for the next three days, things were going to change. I got to the auditorium before anybody else on my staff went. And I, the guy would open the door for me, and he, would, him and I both, I learned where all the lights were. I'd open up all the lights on the dressing rooms and everything, and I had my praise and worship music playing on my phone. Um, you know, the breakthrough song, this is my breakthrough, I'm going to break through, okay? And I'm just praying over every single dressing room. I am praying in the spirit. I'm casting out every demon that may have been hiding in all those little rooms and in the auditorium. And I mean, they could hear my music through the whole place. And I'm just praying and pleading the blood of Jesus over everybody, every person that walks in those doors, every dancer that hits the stage. I was praying for everything before anybody ever got there. Why? Because I brought my banner with me. I brought my God with me, and it was going to make a difference. Now, how were the next three days? They were amazing. The parents weren't angry. The kids weren't little terrors. You know, everything went perfectly. In fact, pastor will tell you that when I come home at the night, every night, I wasn't tired. I'd, I'd come home and I'd start doing dishes and I'd clean the house and I was doing all kinds of stuff. And he's looking at me like, what happened to you? <laughs> well, you know, there were no crosswords. There was no, no anger. Nobody was fighting. It was perfect. So my question is to you, is what are you dreading right now? What are you facing? I had to face those other three days. 
Are you taking God with you? Or are you leaving him at home? Are you taking God with you? Or are you leaving him in church? And the second you walk out the door, okay, God, I'm done. I can do it. I'm, I'm strong. I can do it all by myself. Are you taking your banner with you? Let him be the banner that makes a way where there is no way. Pastor us. Give the glory to God. Give him some praise online. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much. And uh, now I understand the conversation coming in the ha when we were driving in. She was like, what's, what's the name for God? Jehovah Nisi and all the rest of this stuff. I have a new coffee cup, apparently. That, yeah, it does need some espresso. I can see through it. It's not strong enough. No, no, no huh? it's, it's calling hot. <laughs> you get to watch an accident up here with me recorded in front of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that took me off guard. Oh, my goodness. I'll go ahead and dismiss the kids. It's time to head on back to Kids Church. God bless you so much. Have a wonderful time. Let me just go ahead and highlight a few things for you that you need to know about coming up this Christmas season here at Faith Family. Upper Zoom this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. We're studying the book of Isaiah. It is Absolutely an eye-opening, encouraging uh, 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 Bible study that you can be a part of. Voltage growth track here, Baptism of the Holy Spirit, 6.30 p.m. And then they've kicked off the purpose of Christmas Sundays at 9.15 a.m. So you can get with either Randy or Dina, and uh, they're going to be teaching that for the next couple of weeks online or in-house. Then beginning in January, we are going to kick off a new eight-week series entitled Freedom. If you are looking for freedom in your life, freedom in the spirit, freedom from fear, freedom from anything that is holding you back from being who God created you to be, do not miss this. This will be in-house, on campus, and online. So I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm going to be teaching that series with a help from a few of my friends, um, and I'll share that to you whenever we get there. Now, uh, December 7, 17th, here it is, December 17th, the river here, 6.30 p.m., prayer worship. That's also going to be a special healing service. You need a touch from heaven, you need to be here in that service on the 17th. The 19th is Christmas Sunday, and we're going to be having a children's nativity uh, play on a shoestring budget. That's the name of it, literally. That is the name of it. We're going to have a lot of fun up here, and we are welcoming everyone to come and be a part of it. God bless you so much for already inviting people right now and making sure you put that in your calendar. You don't want to miss out on that as we have this wonderful, wonderful event that is going to present itself on the 19th. Then that evening, 6 to 8 p.m., down at the Shark Shack, here at the ice cream shop. You can find that when you can Google that online for those of you who want to be there. Christmas caroling. We're going to be taking everybody down there. We're just going to go set up on the front lawn, and we're going to enjoy Christmas carols together. It's going to be a ministry and a time that you don't want to miss out on, and we're going to have a lot of fun down there during that time. Christmas candlelight communion, 11 p.m. on the 24th. Right? 24th. That's right. 24th. And Eric's going to be preaching in that sermon. Everybody said Amen. Oh, you're a little better in the 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock's not that encouraged about it, but, uh, but you seem to be doing better. Eric feels better now. He's got, he's got, he's got like, oh, i got people going to be showing up. And then the after Christmas, Christmas Sunday. So sa Saturday's Christmas, that uh, following Sunday's after Christmas, Christmas Sunday. And we're going to be having a family breakfast brought, uh, given to you by Men's Ministries at 9 a.m. You can bring as many people as you want. You can't out-eat these guys. They're going to bring more food and you know what to do with. And then there will be no hope groups but we will have the 1030 service. And uh, that will be a time for us here together after Christmas, Christmas Sunday. Now, at this particular point in time, I want to ask you a question. Do you still love missionaries? Yes. Yeah, uh, just same as 8 o'clock. They still like them better than Eric. So, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have some special guests here with us this morning. Hugert, did I get it right? Huggert, Huggert, there we go. 
Don't know why that's so hard for me. Uh, the Huggards are here and our missionaries to the Philippines. I'm going to invite them here to the platform to share with you for the next few minutes what you can do through their ministry to be able to see this world change for the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is going to be a wonderful time here together. God bless you so much. Welcome them as they come to the platform. Go ahead and start the video. why we in AGWM would plant an international church that uses English or another language that's not native to that country because it's strategic. Major cities of the world host government and corporate employees from all over the globe. And like many foreigners, they and their families are lonely as they cope with cultural and career changes. Usually, they are very open to making friends, thus providing our international churches with an excellent opportunity to reach out to this population and introduce them to the gospel. After these expats become believers, they are ambassadors of Christ in their work in that country or wherever else they may transfer. As you can see, international church ministry fits well within our missiology and emphasizes our theme, every tribe, every nation. Hello, we are David and Cheryl Huggerts, and we are Penn Florida missionaries, missionaries to Asia Pacific, and we are happy to be here with you today. Uh, how many of you have ever received good news? How many of you have ever heard the good news of Jesus Christ? In our part of the world, in Asia Pacific, there's 980 million people, and 95% of them 918 per, uh, million have not heard the gospel even one time. The good news is only the good news if it gets there in time. Now, Cheryl and I, we are, uh, we are preparing to uh, go to the Philippines. We will be based in Cebu City, which is uh, on the island of Cebu. And there are 3.4 million people on the island total. Cebu City has 2.9 million but the island's only 120 miles long and 20 miles wide. But you only, you only can live on half of the island because of a mountain range and jungle. So if you could imagine 3.4 million people in 10 miles long, 120 miles uh, long, 10 miles wide, that's the type of place where we live. Now, you say, what's so big about planting a church there, an international church? It's because Cebu City has uh, just erupted on the international scene in just the last couple of years, so much so that November of 2019, the United States government, I mean the United Nations, designated uh, that Cebu is a global city. It has tremendous impact on business and education and culture around the world and many people come there from many different countries in order to come there to work or to study at one of the 11 major universities you need to know international English so when they come there they come from many different nations of the world and they come from many many different language groups but when they come there, they have to know international English, and they don't even have any friends. Oftentimes, they don't have family who's come with them. And they come there, and they have come for work or for study. But while they are there, we want to reach them with the gospel of Christ. You see, in many parts of the world where we are going to live, Many of those nations will not allow missionaries. And the presidents, the kings, and the ayatollahs, they make decrees that Christianity is banned. And if you get caught being a Christian, you can be arrested or imprisoned or uh, whatever they choose. And so they make laws saying that missionaries can't come there. And they basically say Jesus isn't welcome there. However, when they make those hard and fast rules... God sits on his throne, kicks back with a big old belly laugh, and he laughs. And he puts it in their heart, send your students to Cebu City. Send your um, doctors and nurses for training to Cebu City. And when they come there, they think they're just coming for study or for work. 
But God is arranging a divine appointment for them that they can hear the gospel there. And so what we are doing, we are going to be launching an international church and a disciple training center. We are targeting people who have never heard the gospel from around the world. Tens of thousands of them are in Cebu City. So we're targeting the never reached. And we're training disciples how to boldly and wisely live missionary lives in places that are often access restricted, places that have little or no gospel presence at all. And we're training them how to go back into these places and to establish communities of Christ followers where the church is not yet, but soon will be. And it's because of people like you these things happen. When you support missionaries, you're not just supporting Cheryl and I. You are actually helping to support those that we are training so they can go into dark places and share the gospel. Cheryl, would you mind uh, speaking for just a moment? Good morning. How many of you believe in prayer? Amen. I have to have it every day to make my life work. Well, we need your prayers while we go to the Philippines. Well, we've been going through all of this COVID thing. They have been quarantined to stay in their homes, and they weren't able to come out. They're now beginning to let them come out of their homes. They're getting to go and do a little more than they were. And they've opened up their doors to have the people come back from other countries into their country. And so we need you to pray that God will quicken their hearts, is preparing their hearts. And when we get there, their hearts are ready to hear the word of God. The second thing that we'd like for you to pray about is we would like for you to pray for us to have a team. It takes more than one person or two people to make a church work. It takes a group and takes a team. And so we are looking for a team to go with us to help us to build this international church and a disciple training team also. And we need a building. It's a hot place. That Philippines is very warm, like, you know, August weather around here. And so we need a building. And God has that building. We just don't know where it is yet. And we know that God will show us where to go and to get that building. So if you will, please remember us that their hearts will be ready, that also we will get a team, and they will help us to grow what God has planned. And the third thing is just to have that building. Thank you so much for your prayers. Let me, uh, let me conclude our part here on these remarks. Um, we've got good news. We just sent out an email early this morning uh, to announce to all of the churches and the pastors uh, in the state of Florida and pastors from other states who are joining with us that uh, even though the country of the Philippines it remains closed to new visas, we have been given an exemption to the travel ban. And our visas are in process. We have a letter from the Philippine government saying we will be allowed to enter. But there's two, two uh, catches. Number one, they will allow us to enter, but we must do it before February the 3rd. Uh, and so our plans would be to leave right at the end of January because we've got to make sure that uh, we don't get held up somewhere in some other country, some airport, and get delayed and show up a day late. So we, we will leave hopefully the end of January. Secondly, we're trying, we are completing raising our budget right now because we are not allowed to leave the country till all of our work budget and everything is 100% uh, raised. We want you to pray with us that that takes place. I started out my ministry at the age of 19. I started my missionary ministry in the Philippines. Then after that, I came back, met my wife. We got married, and uh, then we became missionaries in Central America and South America. We pastored churches and planted churches here in the States and continued our ministry around the world. Now God has opened up this wonderful door to go back overseas. I want to tell you, when you give to your missionary program here at church, when you join with pastor and, uh, and write those monthly missionary checks and support, you're not just supporting one or two missionaries, but you are helping to support missionaries around the world. And let me tell you, your missionary dollars, the sun never sets on your missionary dollar, and it's always daytime somewhere where you're helping to send the gospel forth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. 
I'm excited about what God is doing. Somebody say amen. amen for us to be able to do that. Our missions offering today in its totality goes all to them. So whatever you give online or here in-house today, God bless you for doing that so much. They have to raise a cash budget. They have to have so much on a hand. And then they also have to raise monthly support in order to be able to go. And they're, they're um, what would you say, you said 87, 80 something, something percent ish? 85, so 85% that they're there, and so they just got a few weeks to close the gap, and we want to be able to help them to be able to do that and to make that become a reality, because not only what do we do here in Palm City matters and what we do in Martin County matters, but it matters also what we do to reach our country and to reach our world, and we want to be a part of that, and I want you to be have an opportunity to receive that blessing also. As I uh, mentioned uh, in the first service. It's 20 days till Christmas, so you have been warned. If you have not started shopping yet, just saying, um, anyhow, uh, you, 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 you might, might want to kind of pick it up here a little bit. Um, you know, maybe you've got a good plan, uh, something, and you're just giving out cash cards, whatever. But, uh, but you better, better have a plan right now. I mentioned last week that this is a season of giving. We prepare to give during this season. We prepare to give gifts. We prepare to uh, uh, give um, um, and to cook for people and invite them to our house and to give parties and and, and family gatherings. And this is just a season where we do this and we do it with some intensity. I was driving around Stewart yesterday and I'm thinking people are out here with some intensity because I had three parking places stolen from me. Uh, and they were very passionate about doing that. And I said, you need Jesus. The stealing is a sin. And, uh, um, and um, of course, that all came through my horn uh, whenever, whenever, but that's what I was saying whenever, whenever that happened. I want to thank you for your giving. We are able to send to to uh, many of our, uh, and I don't want to say how many because I might get it wrong, but a bunch of our firemen are going to be getting a blessing from Faith Family Worship Center uh, in a, in the form of cookies. And um, it's just a way we're able to do this right now. COVID kind of changed our plans. We did a pivot on it, and they're looking forward to their snickerdoodles. And so... I just like saying snickerdoodle. The, uh, um, <clears throat> I'll be honest with you, but... But nonetheless, we're going to be uh, blessing a lot of different shifts at different uh, um, firehouses here in Martin County and letting them know that we appreciate them and we're praying for them all the time. And uh, also that we were able to bless Teen Challenge Men's Center in Sanford with food this past uh, Sunday for their annual family Thanksgiving gathering, and especially for those who didn't have family who would come and be with them, uh, Paul Houston and uh, represented us and I said did you have a have a uh, just a, a table full of orphans and he said yeah uh, basically that's what, what it was and we were able to be there and be a blessing for them and for the next couple of weeks you have an opportunity to be able to bless a foster family that we've adopted then you can go to our website if you go to the discover page there's a link there you can find out more about it I don't want to take too much time but we're going to be helping a single mom who has three foster children that she is now in the process of adopting as she has had for three years in order to be able to take them to Disney for a few days and allow them to be able to experience that. They've never been. That's something they've never had. And so if you can do something to be able to make that experience better for them, that will be wonderful. And I know it will be a blessing to them and to us as we do that. Now, I'm reminded of a couple who were traveling, and they couldn't find a place to stay in a town that wherever they were tra where they were traveling to. But somebody was gracious enough to give them a stable to be able to, to, to stay in. And there in that stable, they had the opportunity to use whatever was available, which was a feeding trough, a manger, to be able to have a baby. It was giving that made the birth of Jesus possible in that um, most inopportune opportunity. And I know that sometimes we find ourselves in inopportune opportunities. God shows us and gives us the opportunity to do things at the worst possible time. We get interrupted in our schedule when we do not want God to be able to be messing with it. He comes into the middle of our plans and says, this is, season is now over. I want you to do something else, but I'm not ready for that, God. I don't want that to happen yet. You see, our giving isn't a performance art. 
It isn't something that we do to impress people. It isn't something that we do in order to garner attention or praise or applause for ourselves. Giving is an act of love. Generosity is an act of our hearts. Somebody say amen. And uh, to others and unto God. As we love one another, as we love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with our tithe, with our offering, unto missions, or whatever God places upon your heart in the moment to be able to serve him, it is a blessing for us to be able to give. And we are living in times whenever giving is necessary. It's a part of who we are, and we cannot forget that. So, Lord, I pray that you will bless everyone as they give generously from their hearts unto you. Bless every tither, every giver. Bless every person who supports this missions work in the Philippines. Bless every person who has it upon their heart to make a difference in these foster children's lives. Bless every person who takes the time to pray for somebody this week, to put an encouraging arm around them and say an encouraging word to them. Bless everyone who uses their skills and abilities to build the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray that you will continue to use us in your will to make a difference in the lives of people who need to know Jesus and discover his hope today. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, so thank you for your giving online at ffwc.us forward slash giving or cash app or mail in or the receptacle there in the back or however you do it. And for everyone online, I was just checking, looks like there's around 20, 25 people online here with us. You never can get a real accurate count with that. But uh, um, I mean, you got, you, you may have one phone, you may have five people sitting behind it. You never know uh, to be able to watch that. But if you've, you, if you haven't said hello to us and let us know you're here, please do so. We would would love to be able to connect with you online and to uh, have the opportunity to get to know who you are and, and where you are at and what God is doing in your life. Please feel free to jump online and even go to our website and check us out more. If this is your first time here, God bless you. And everybody said, thank you, Jesus. Turn to Luke chapter number one. If you've got the Version app, you can find us there in the events and you can follow along in the notes and the scriptures are all there right there for you to be able to enjoy. You know, Chris, music and Christmas go hand in hand. How many of you notice that? Amen? How many of you notice Christmas music before Thanksgiving? Yeah. And how many of you, that kind of made you mad. Uh, it was like, nope, not yet, not yet, not yet. But there was places. I mean, just as soon as Halloween was over, we wish you a Merry Christmas. I'm like, well, this is a little early. The, uh, uh, and, and all of that. But uh, yes, music and Christmas go hand in hand. And I mean, you just... There is just so much of it out there that we can do. Now, I'm going to look over here on my right and say, somebody shout over here on my right, your left. What's your favorite Christmas song? Anybody? Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? Oh, that's a good one right there. Center section, somebody tell me. What's your favorite? What's your favorite? Jingle bells. Yes, I love jingle bells. Did you know jingle bells? Well, I'll tell that story later. Anyhow, over here on the left, what, what, uh, what's your favorite? What's your favorite Christmas song? I mean, I mean, I don't know what they said. I have no idea. Bread for what? Breath of heaven. Man, I haven't heard that in years. Okay, wow. Uh, to be able to do that. You can go, those of you online and even in the version app, you, I have a survey. There's 10 songs to choose from. Let me know which one is your favorite. If we got a, if we got a runaway, we'll, uh, uh, I'll let you know next Sunday who, what, your, what everyone's favorite is. But we have favorite songs. We love to listen to these certain songs. If they come on the radio, we turn it up. We've got it on Spotify. We've got them on our playlists anywhere. We just love this, and we'll play it on, on, on rotation. We'll just let it keep going and going and going because we just want to get it. And because, you know, the day after Christmas, we quit listening to Christmas music, even though we'll go down the road and start whistling it. That's what I do. Uh, it takes absolutely nothing to do with Christmas whatsoever. He, it was his interpretation of Psalms 98. And he was writing a poem, which became a song that was about the second coming of Jesus and his reign and rule here upon the earth that we were going to get to jo enjoy for all, for all of time. Joy to the world. Jesus came back. And we're all looking for that. Amen. Now you say, well, should I um, keep singing joy to the world? Absolutely. You should still keep singing joy to the world and you can keep that secret to yourself and let everybody else believe whatever they want. But I also question that you need to ask yourself, if you've been praying about something and God has been silent about it, what is he doing in the silence? 
What is happening? What is God doing in the background for Romans had created a stable environment by which the church would be able to thrive in? Up to that point in time, the church would have never made it and also created a network of roads that made for the first time in mankind's history the ability for people to travel the known world. And so people were able to cross the known world at that time. They were able to cross the Mediterranean Sea. They were able to go as far as Spain and even up into England. And we see this as a result of all of this, the message of Jesus and the gospel could move freely in the known world at that particular point in time. God was also preparing a family to change the world in that moment. A, 60 years prior to this event, a man and a woman were born. He was born into the tribe of Levi, and he would serve God as a priest in the temple in Jerusalem. She was born from the tribe of Judah and was a direct descendant of King David himself. We think about Mary and Joseph so often in, our, in, in, in the Christmas story, as we should, and we'll probably look at them next week. But here, I want to look at Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. And if you don't know, Jesus and John the Baptist are cousins, and they're only about three months apart in their births. What is God preparing for you in this season that you are in right now? We're going to look here at Zechariah, and we're going to see that God was preparing him for something. And at 60 plus years of age, we find that he discovers what God had in store for him all that time, that he is being prepared for this one moment that we go into as their tradition priests would come and they would serve in the temple. There are 18,000 priests in Israel at this particular point in time. That's a lot of priests, okay, right? And they were broken up into clans, and those clans would serve every two weeks. And so two weeks out of the year, Zachariah's clan would go and serve at the temple. Well, there's more priests in our duty, so how would they divvy up the jobs? They did so by uh, using lots, or what we would call drawing straws. So they say, go around and they're divvying up the responsibilities for the two weeks among e each one of them. Zechariah draws the straw or the lot to be the one who will offer incense right before the Holy of Holies. The most esteemed of all of the duties that they could offer to a priest at that time. And there he is, and he's going, and this is a once in a lifetime thing. He can't do it again. Once he's in, his name will be taken out of the drawings for the rest of his life. A priest that got one chance to be able to go as close to God as possible without going into the presence of God, which was only for the high priest once a year at the Day of Atonement. So he is going to go there, and he's going to offer burn, which was done twice a day there in front of the, um, in front of the Holy of Holies. He's going there in order to burn this incense unto God. And it would be that event that would change the rest of his life. Time came for him to go into the temple. He's prepared. He knows what to do. He is surrounded by people who have done it before. He has read the word of God. He knows what's in there. He knows exactly what his responsibility is to be in that moment. He is there in that place to worship God. He is there in that place to be prepared to be the holiest man, as close to God as he could possibly be. He is there to honor God with his and, and his in obedience unto God's law of what should be happening there in the presence at that particular moment and in that particular time. And in that worship, in that place, in 400 years of silence, I got a feeling that as he's offering that incense, he looks over and he sees Gabriel standing over there. Now, this would probably be something nobody had mentioned before. There he is, and he's in there doing his job, and then, yeah, what are you, hello? What's happening? What's going on? And what should have been in that moment to be something wonderful and great is completely changed as a result of the fact that God breaks his silence. Right there in that moment, Zachariah is just caught there. And, and Gabriel looks at him and says, Zachariah, you and your wife have been chosen to bring into the forerunner the one who is going to announce the arrival of the Messiah. He gave him instructions. He even tells him his name is going to be John. You and your wife are going to have a baby. And he's sitting there going, man, that was over a long time ago. 
we don't do that anymore. That's not something what in a, and Zechariah in that moment is so caught up in everything that is happening that he questions, he balks at what Gabriel is saying. And I know many times you have found yourself in a place whenever God has told you something and you said, <laughs> no, uh-uh, that's not, no, 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 no. What are you talking about? You want me to do what? You want me to do where? You want me to give what? You want me, Lord, no, uh-uh. And in our desire to be in such control of our lives, in our desire to be our own God, small g, in our desire in order to say that, we, you know, we got everything together, we're okay, we're looking good, we've got it all nice and everything and, every, and all the rest of this stuff, when God shows up, we will do exactly what Zachariah did in that moment, balk at him. Well, hold it now just a minute. Let's talk here a minute, Jesus, because I think you made a mistake. Like God can make mistakes. Nobody in here is talking to me now. I hope you're talking to me online. Hope we can get some amens or something there. Everybody's looking at me going, oh, I hope he moves on to the next point. All right. He asked Gabriel for proof. <laughs> He's an angel from heaven. You want proof. You know, at that point in time, I, I'll be looking at Zechariah going, shh, 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 no, 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 no. Oh, this is not going to go well. Gabriel's presence was proof enough. Zechariah asked for proof. <laughs> Gabriel says, you want proof? You're not going to be able to speak until that child is born. There's proof enough for you. Hmm. I always wondered once in a while if God didn't, doesn't want to just, to just put the mute button on us, you know, so we would stop saying things that would destroy our faith. That we would stop saying things that would steal our joy. How many of you have ever said something, you come back later and go, what was that? What, why? why would I do that to myself? Hello? I think God was doing Zachariah a favor. I think this was a blessing to keep him silent. <laughs> Now, I don't know that for sure, but of all the things that God could have chosen to break 400 years of silence with, what does he do? He strikes the man of God. He tells, silent. He goes, mm, that's enough out of you. You just sit there, and for the next few months, we're going to be working on you. I'm sure that one thing that Zechariah does is pray, and he can hear from God. He just can't say a thing about it. Well, nine months pass by, John the Baptist is born. And there in the temple on the eighth day, they bring him. And at that point, that's whenever they circumcise a child. And they also name him. So it's tradition for the firstborn son to be named after the father. And whenever they begin to do that, no. Zachariah is like, no. And his speech immediately came back. And he says, his name shall be John. People are like, what? And from here, we see Zechariah the priest become Zechariah the prophet. And now everyone knows that God is speaking. The 400 years of silence is over. Nobody has prophesied in the temple for 400 years. Nobody has had a new word from God for 400 years. Nobody has heard from God for 400 years. And here we are at the circumcision of this baby, and God shows up. And he begins to speak through Zechariah. Verse 68. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. Redeem means to buy back by paying a price. To set free by paying a price. God declared that he was going to set people free from their sins. He declared that he is going to set people free from the things that this world would do to place you into bondage, to deliver people from the evil that would try to destroy them. But the price that is to be paid wasn't going to be found in money or works or religion, but that price is going to be found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
Jesus understood this in Luke chapter 4, 18, where he quotes a prophecy about himself spoken 700 years earlier. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. The blind will see that the oppressed will be set free. This is a freedom of all of our life, body, soul, and spirit. It doesn't matter where the bondage is at, Jesus will show up. It doesn't matter what the problem is, Jesus is there. What we know is that hell would tell us that you have to wallow in your misery for the rest of your life, and what you are is what you are. And Jesus said, I never created that, but my presence and my power can change you. I will redeem you from what this world tries to put you under, and I will give you a new hope, a new life, a new vision, a new calling, a new purpose to be able to serve me. Verse number 69, he has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David. Jesus came to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. When you can't fix your car, you call a mechanic. When you can't fix your back, you call your chiropractor. Twice this week, one more time on Monday. My back's out. Uh, but I'm doing much better than I did last week. <laughs> Ooh, I don't want to do that again. Do you have people that you call on when you need help? Well, let me tell you, when it comes to your soul, you cannot save yourself. When it comes to your soul, your religion is not going to save you. Whenever it comes to your soul, whatever you've made up and that kind of deal you made with God isn't going to cut it. Only Jesus can save you. The angel said in Luke 12, 10, and 11, Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring joy to all people, the Savior. Yes, the Messiah, the Son of God, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Zachariah's song isn't about John the Baptist. Zachariah's song is about the Son of God. And after 60 years of faithfulness with no children, I can't get in too, too much into this. You can check my podcast out later on it. But I, I want you to know they didn't have children, which meant that people looked upon them as cursed. People looked upon Elizabeth and Zechariah as cursed. He is a faithful priest, but God doesn't like him very much because he didn't give them children. This is what people would have been thinking. And you know, in all of these years of silence, they remain faithful. In all those years of silence, they stayed true to their God. They never gave up. And it is in this moment, after 60 plus years, that he discovers his purpose to serve in the kingdom of God. You may be in a place and you say, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. You remain faithful. God will break his silence. He will speak into your life. He will make a difference. In verses 76 and 77, you and you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. How to find salvation, to forgive, to send away, to dismiss a debt. Our identity is sinners. Everybody here knows you're a sinner. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd still be a sinner. Everybody here knows you're not perfect. And you know that it's grace and mercy of God that keeps God from just turning you into a greasy spot on the ground. Hello? Because that's what we deserve. It is the grace and mercy of God because we ask for forgiveness. But that identity is not who you are supposed to be today. While we identify with that sinner, we are to identify with our salvation. And here we see that we have a Jesus who comes and forgives us so that we no longer have to be bound to our past. We no longer have to be bound to our mistakes and our failures and our sins. I didn't, I didn't expect a name in there, but I thought I'd give you a chance. The, uh, uh, we no longer have to be bound to anything else, but we can now find a new and a better purpose and life for ourselves to be able to serve him with all that is within us. Jesus has a new purpose for you, but you got to let go of this in order to have that. And there's a lot of people who are followers of Jesus, and they're still hung up over here. you got to let that go and let forgiveness happen in your life once and for all. 
Verses 78 and 79, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Woo! Think about this. Is Jesus came here to give light in a dark world, to give us a path to walk on that is safe, to give us hope where there is no hope. There are people today who are calling out and say, I can't find hope. I don't know where hope is. I'm looking for hope. I need hope to arrive. I need hope to show up. Here's, here's the newsflash. Hope's already here. Hope showed up in a manger over 2,000 years ago, and his presence has never left this place ever since. He is still the king and the Lord of all. We are here to prove to the fact of the world that Christmas isn't just some kind of celebration. Christmas is the fact that we are here to receive what we could not do for ourselves. We are here to experience what he has in store for us. And hell would like to say, no, 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 don't look at the light. Yes, look at the light and smile because there is hope and there is life where Jesus is. So why do we celebrate Christmas? Trees, lights, music? It's all nice, but it's about what God's done for us. It's about him doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The greatest gift of all isn't going to be parked in a driveway or found under a tree. The greatest gift of all is something that cannot be bought. It cannot be purchased. John was the prophet of the Most High, Luke chapter 176. He introduced to Israel the Son of the Most High, Luke 132, who was conceived in Mary's womb by the power of the Most High, Luke chapter 1, verse number 35. Christmas is about the power of God existing in our lives today. It was a miracle that happened over 2,000 years ago. It was a miracle that happened on Easter Sunday. It was a miracle when you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ. It was a miracle when he spoke into your heart and says, Thus saith the Lord. It was a miracle that happens every day whenever he extends his grace and love and goodness to you at every moment, giving you reason to worship him and to give him the best that you have to offer. And that takes me back to the altar of incense. What does the altar and incense represent? The prayers of the people. That incense, that smoke would wave its way in through the veil into the Holy of Holies, representing that God is ever, ever hearing the prayers of his people. But what do you do when he's silent? You struggle. Some of you struggling in silence right now. You've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed until you think your prayer is broke. You have poured out. You have done everything right that you can think. You've tried everything. You'd listen to anyone. You would do whatever it took. Lord, I'm believing in you. By your stripes, I'm healed. I'm believing you. You're going to restore my marriage. I'm believing you. My kids are going to come to know you. I'm believing you. You're going to give me a future with hope. Lord, I'm believing in you. And you pray. And what do you hear? God, are you there? Do you even care? Nothing seems to work. And you think, God, now what? I've done everything I can do, but apparently you don't want to? No. Don't say that. That's not what God's asking of you. Be faithful. Be faithful. Some people are saying, well, when God shows up, I'll be faithful. God will never show up. I'll tell you that right now because he already did at the cross. He doesn't have to die there again for you. You need to accept what he has already done. But God hasn't done anything, and you trust him for that because you don't know what he's doing behind the scenes. You don't know what he's preparing you for. You don't know what's going on. You say, well, why doesn't he tell me? He's not obligated to tell you. 
And let's be honest, if he did tell you, you probably run screaming down the street going, no, 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 God, no. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit being faithful. Don't quit being in his word. Don't quit praying. Don't quit being in the body of Christ in this church. Don't quit. Now is not the time. This world is saying, give it up. Your religion isn't any good before, and it's really no good now. No, actually, I'm finding that God is being more of who he is now than he's ever been before. He is speaking into people's lives. He is doing a work. You say, why would you tell me that? Because there is a day coming that you will be praying and God will show up. Don't lose faith. Stand with me if you would please. Father, I thank you for what you've done for your many blessings. And I pray that you pour out your spirit upon your people in this place today. Lord, we love you. We do. We love you, Lord Jesus. You are so, so wonderful to us. And here in this place and time, where are you at? What do you need to tell God right now? Those of you online, what do you need to tell? You're, you're in a place where God hasn't spoken. You've been in silence and you're thinking, I just don't know. I just don't know. What, what should I do? How should I do this? What's happening? What's taking place? Crying out to God and just begin to worship him. You may not know this, but whenever the altar of incense, when all of this was set up at Mount Sinai with Moses, thousands of years before, even before uh, uh, Zechariah, the purpose of worship, the, 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 the purpose of learning worship was to understand the purposes of God. Through worship, they understood who God was. Through worship, they would understand what his will was. Through worship, they would begin to see what he is and who he is, his character and his love and his graciousness. It was there that they learned through their worship who their heavenly father was who loved them so much to haul them out of Egypt and to set them free from slavery. Who is the God you worship today? Who are you worshiping right now? In the midst of your silence, are you looking somewhere else for help? Are you looking, are you grabbing at straws? What is it that you're doing? And I'm just going to tell you right now, calm your heart. Take a breath. And worship him. Everyone here in this place, those of you online, just take a moment and just say, I love you, Lord. And I worship you and you alone. In your silence, I trust you. In your silence, you love me. In your silence, you have never forgotten me. In your silence, you're pouring out your spirit on me. In your silence, you're preparing a path for me to go down. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will draw me ever closer to you. I want to be as close to you as Zachariah was right on the other side of that veil. I want to be so close that my prayers will enter into your presence, O oh Lord. I want to be so close to you right now, Lord Jesus. I need you. I need you now more than ever, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon your people in this place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. God bless. Amen.